It's a very good day. So um, I want to go ahead and kick this off. Thank you all for joining us today. It's wonderful to see all of your faces. Um, Dr. Ledger is here today and uh, I know that you probably all saw the video that I forwarded to you. A part of it, yeah. It's, uh, it's a wonderful video if you get a chance to take a look at it. But Dr. Ledger and her team work along the Purple Line construction and have found, have made a number of discoveries as far as um, fossils. So uh, she's going to share with us some of her favorite discoveries, I guess, and um, uh, talk to us a little bit about her work along the Purple Line. And I want to just also introduce Glysa Robles. She's part of the Red Line team, uh, Purple Line team. Where are you, Glysa? There's Glysa. She's Where? waving. Oh. Um, so I'm sure if there were any questions about the Purple Line, Glysa would probably um, have an answer or could find it for us. So I want to welcome, welcome them both. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and mute all of you, if that's okay, or you, if you could mute yourselves, um, I'm going to hand it over to, to Dr. Ledger. Take it away. Well, thank you so much, Lily, and thank you everybody for having me. This sounds like a good time, and I'm hoping I can get in on those recipes that you're going to get at your <laughs> next meeting, because that sounds fabulous. Um, it's so wonderful to see everybody's smiling faces in the morning, and I'm glad I get to share a little bit of information with you. I did hear that you got to see the video that Metro put out through the source and they really did a fabulous job. I was blown away when I saw it. Uh, I love talking about fossils. It's like my, my secret power is that I really enjoy it. And so to have them bring it together in such a way where it was so captivating to every age. I had little tiny cousins all across the country and then, you know, grandparents that were like, oh, this is so wonderful and so informative. But at the same time to captivate someone who's four years old, uh, I was really pleased with that. And I'm glad our fossils are making such an impact because they're really amazing. And without the construction work, we wouldn't have the access to even find such wonderful fossils. Now, I am very laid back and relaxed, and I do want to answer your questions. So I know Lily had everybody mute themselves, but if you have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and be like, hey, Dr. Ashley, Dr. Ashley, I have a question, because I don't want to leave you, you know, just waiting for that answer. I'm happy to jump in and help answer questions. Now, I am going to steal the screen so I can show you some slides here. Share screen. This one. All right. Can everybody see the screen? I see head nods and that's, that is perfect. So Wilshire Boulevard has ended up being a treasure trove and that is the best way I know how to describe it. We have found over 2000 fossils from pretty much every species you can think of from the ice age and they come in waves. Uh, during the pandemic, we have found very few fossils along the Purple Line at all, but that's pretty normal. For us, that means, yes, we have something big coming because we'll go for a couple months where we find fossils almost every day. And we'll go for six months where we don't find anything because of a big wave of fossils. But the the important part of this process is that, one, we would never know about these fossils if it wasn't for the construction. Because really, who's going to let me dig an 80 foot wide by 1,000 foot long by 100 foot deep hole under Wilshire Boulevard? No one, unless it's for a really good purpose. And we go right past the La Brea Tar Pits, so we know that we are in very fossiliferous sediments. So every day is exciting. Um, I see a message popped up, Lily, that there's someone in the waiting room. I'm not sure how to access that. Would you like me to hit admit or did you get them? I see I have an admit button. I got them. Perfect. Perfect. I just, it popped up on my screen. I'm not used to those notifications. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about how this works. Since you're all working with, you know, transportation and folks using the bus system, I get that construction can be a bit of a hassle. It creates more dust, it creates more noise, it slows, it slows down traffic just a little bit. But remember, even during all of that disruption, there is science happening behind the scenes. 
So what my team does is we watch every bit of excavation. If there is someone digging somewhere, my team is there looking. Now, in the beginning, it's pretty simple. They're standing at street level, looking down into the pit, watching everything happen. Then we eventually get underground. The Cogstone monitor is the woman on the far left of the screen, and you can see that they're there digging away, and she is there watching every single bucket of dirt. Now, fossils might sound like something really hard to spot during the excavation, but it's actually easier than you would think once you know what you're looking for. Because all of our bones pretty much have what we call a discovery mark, it's where it's actually been disturbed by the heavy equipment. So it's got a scratch or a break, but that, that fresh cut is a very distinct flash of color and texture that looks so different from the dirt around it. Our monitors go, hey, we found something, we need to take a look at that. Now other times, if you can imagine, we're finding small fossils, vertebrae, tail bones, um, limb bones from smaller and fists. Well, as you can well imagine, you're to breaking up, Dr. Ledger. The dirt. I'm, uh oh. Um, am I back? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? I have no idea what happened. Technology and I are not friends, probably because I play in the dirt all day long, every day. But if uh, if it breaks up again, let me figure it out. Um, anyway, I, I'll just go back a bit. So as you can imagine, there are some fossils that are smaller and you can imagine they just get picked up within the scoop of dirt and we don't necessarily see them in place on the ground. But since our monitors are there all the time and that's what they watch is they watch that dirt being moved. When a fossil comes out of that dirt bucket, it just has a very different shape than the regular dirt. And so it gives them a pretty quick glance of, hey, I need to take a look at that. And we have a very close working relationship with all these operators. They know to keep an eye on us so that when we want to see something, they can give us the sign for go ahead and take a look, we'll wait. Now this is our monitor here in the foreground. And you can see this is a very precarious area. There's two different pieces of equipment working very close together. And safety is the most important thing. My monitor does not want to be standing between those pieces of equipment. So she's actually monitoring underground using binoculars. So we do whatever we need to do to stay safe and still find fossils. And it's been quite interesting. Every single one of my staff members has found fossils at some point. So they're all very excited and they have a bit of a competition going between them. Who can find what and when? For example, Frank is my monitor who's been with us since basically the beginning. And Frank does not have very good luck finding fossils. He has only found a handful but he did find the nearly complete mammoth skull. So by Frank's count, he's still winning. You know, other times it's a little easier. It's flat and open. This is underground under Wilshire Boulevard. And so this monitor is assigned to this piece of equipment and she will follow it around all day long and keep an eye on whatever they're digging. And if you can imagine, the operators actually really like working with us because when they find something, it is, it's commotion and hubbub and excitement. And can't you imagine being these men and women when they go home from a day of work and they sit down to dinner with their families and their families say, oh, how was work today? And every day they say, I moved a lot of dirt. But then on any day where they find fossils, they say, well, I moved a lot of dirt and we uncovered so many fossils and they're from these animals. Can't you just imagine how excited their families are? It's gotta be a great experience. So once we find fossils, we immediately get to work. We want to get those fossils out of the ground as quickly and as safely as possible so that the work can go right back into that area. Now, the best part of this is we don't ever stop the work. We'll take a look, see if it's a rock or a fossil. If it's a fossil, we say, sorry guys, we need to dig right here. Can you move 50 feet that way? That gives us an area of safety, but allows them to continue working. And then as soon as the fossils are out, we say, okay, you're good to go. Please dig a little deeper for us because really they're doing the heavy lifting for us. They're doing the excavation that most paleontologists do by hand. Now this was the first fossil find from the purple line. This is the beginning of it. You can see there are several boxes littering the site full of bone fragments. And so we knew we were coming up to something. 
Now the excavator that was working did happen to hit the end of a bone and it shattered it into lots and lots of little pieces. And so we started collecting those pieces until we basically followed them like a treasure map. Okay, here's where the pieces are strewn. If we follow this backwards, we'll eventually find the source. And we did, it ended up being a mammoth tusk. And ivory is what tusks are made out of. And ivory is kind of a museum curator's worst nightmare. It is very, very brittle and breaks very easily. Now, if you've ever been to a doctor's office where they have the water machine with the stack of conical cups, the little cones stacked in inside of each other, that's how mammoth tusks grow. They are stacks of ivory cones. And so when the excavator hit the end of one of those cones, it shattered into this box of pieces. But we were able to follow it back, find where it started, and we actually found a complete three foot section of this tusk. But while digging, we actually found another mammoth in the same vicinity. This is the mammoth skull. This is me and a coworker underground working on excavating this. And it's hard to imagine, but mammoth tusks or elephant tusks are their teeth. It is actually part of their dental battery. Tusks are their incisors. They're these front two teeth here. They just get really long and curved. And so we're looking here at the sockets for their tusks and its two tusks. Now, when you think mammoth, you think giant animal, and you're correct. But the mammoth skull we found is from a juvenile. This animal was between six and 10 years old when it died. So in terms of mammoth, it is quite small, but still it's a beautiful specimen. This is what it looked like underground once we were able to excavate all the way around it so that we could start putting a plaster jacket around it. Now, when everybody thinks mammoths, they think cute, cuddly, big, furry elephant. And that is correct, but that is the classic woolly mammoth. Southern A snuffleupagus? Very much like snuffleupagus. <laughs> snuffleupagus is a great analogy for a woolly mammoth. But here in Southern California, we did not have any woolly mammoths. It was much too warm for them here. They prefer colder climates like Canada and Alaska, and even farther north like South Dakota, North Dakota, that kind of area. Down in Southern California, we have the temperate climate mammoths, and they are called the Colombian mammoth. Now this is an artist's rendition of a Colombian mammoth, and you'll see that it looks a lot like an elephant. Now the trick is to remember the size perspective. So if you've ever been to a zoo or a circus, you've probably seen the Asian elephant. It is still a very large animal, but quite small in the world of elephants. You know, they're gonna stand about 10 feet tall at the shoulder. This Colombian mammoth can stand between 15 and 17 feet high at the shoulder. To give you an idea, if you had a full-grown adult woolly mammoth walking next to a full-grown adult Colombian mammoth, the woolly could walk right under its chin and not even bump its head. So the Colombian mammoth was enormous. So to give you an idea how small this skull was, uh, it's just because it's a juvenile. So here we are putting the plaster jacket on the skull. The plaster jacket is a mixture of plaster and burlap strips. It's very robust, very, uh, very strong. And then because the specimen was so big, we actually used rebar and two by fours. And we built those into the jacket to give it stability, not want those tusks to snap off while it was being transported. And we did a good job because nothing broke when we got it to the lab. We opened that jacket back up and it was in perfect condition. Doctor, how old is that tusk that you found? Um, we're not sure an exact age. So in the same area, we actually found the remains of three different animals. We found a three foot section of tusk that belonged to an adult mammoth. We found the juvenile mammoth skull that we have since named Hayden. And then we found one additional rib that was too small to belong to any sort of elephant, baby or adult. And we still are not sure what that rib belonged to because unfortunately the diagnostic end was broken away and we were never able to find that. So we're not sure if it was, excuse me, maybe horse or llama, camel, something in that size range, but it definitely did not belong to an elephant. So something in that exact area where we were working had great bone preservation and allowed those spots to be preserved. Now, as for their geologic age, we know they're from the Pleistocene. 
which ended about 10,000 years ago and started a little over a million years ago. Based on the geology of the area, we have a pretty good guess that we are between 15 and 60,000 years of age. But because Hayden was found so shallow, it was found only about 20 feet below Wilshire Boulevard, we're guessing it was probably around 20,000 years old. But the interesting bit is that most fossils turn to stone. When you've been to a museum and you've seen a mountain dinosaur skeleton, that animal died 65 million plus years ago. And all of the original calcium in the bone is gone and that has turned into stone. Well, because of the environmental conditions where we found Hayden, it is still the original bone and the original ivory material. So it's very unique and we're thrilled to have found such a beautiful specimen. Now this image here, I hope everybody can still see the slides, looks a little different than when you saw this specimen underground. That's because when we dig up a fossil, we put the plaster jacket over the surface we can see. But then to get it out, we flip it over. So that surface you saw underground is now at the bottom of this plaster jacket and we're working on the underside. So if you can see just to the right of her hands, there's two objects that really look like the bottom of your tennis shoes. Does everybody see what I'm looking at? I, I see head nods, excellent. Those are its teeth. Now mammoths are unique. They only have four full, four full teeth in their mounts at any given time, two on the top and two on the bottom, plus their two incisors that stick out of their mouth. But their teeth work completely different than ours. Our teeth start in our gums and grow up or down into our mouths. Mammoth teeth cycle forward like a conveyor belt, pushing the old tooth out ahead of it. So because it looks like, if you're looking at those objects that are its teeth that look like tennis shoes, where the seam would be between the front of your shoe and the heel of the shoe, that's actually the space between two different teeth. And so that's how we're able to age this animal and know that it was between six and 10 years old when it died. We can actually measure those teeth and get that information. Now, unfortunately, because it's a juvenile, it is very hard to tell if it's a male or female. Both male and female Colombian mammoths had tusks, but the easiest way to tell the two sexes apart is by taking measurements from their tusks. When they are adults, males, have much bigger girthy tusks. They get much longer because they're using them for territory defense and for mating. Females are using them more for practical means. They're using them to move a tree to get it out of their way or move some dirt to get to the softer grass around it. And so they have much more gracile tusks. But as a juvenile, the tusks grow at about the same rate. So with an individual this young, we actually can't tell if Hayden is male or female. Just to give you a little glimpse, uh, that is me sitting in the dirt. So I'm sitting next to Hayden's face. That's what the front of it looked like. That's how it was found in the ground. Imagine flipping that over and then you get that image on the right. Now there was one break that was significant in the skull and it, was, it actually happened in the field. We noticed it in the beginning that the tip of his left tusk was not attached. And so that left tusk is sitting there on a black um, oh, you're, cushion you're, right there lost, next to it at Los Angeles County. You lost, oh, that you lost me again? Yeah. Dr. Ledger, can I sure. um, suggest that maybe you turn your camera off? Because sometimes that takes a lot of your your bandwidth or whatever and it can... Sure. So if you turn your camera off, it we may... You, um. I'm not even sure I know how to. If right, I hit stop right. video. Yeah. Okay, I'm still here. Can yeah. you hear me still? Yes. Okay, perfect. Continue. So I'm gonna go back just a little bit. This specimen did have one broken section that we found in the field. The tip of the left tusk was broken away from the rest of the tusk and we're not sure why, but all of these fossils will go to the Los Angeles County Natural History Museum and so we asked them in the process of preparing these fossils to go to the museum, 
would you like us to reattach the tip of the tusk? And they said, no, please leave it separated from the rest. Because when you look down on the tip of that tusk, you can actually see those rings of ivory. It kind of looks like tree rings. And so they thought that was great for educating visitors that wanted to learn more about about Hayden to say, look, we can actually see growth patterns in the ivory of the animal. So they asked those to leave the tusk separated. Um, let's see here. It's not letting me switch slides anymore. Give me just a second. Okay, here we go. This image is actually an artist reconstruction we have of Hayden. Hayden is in the foreground there. He's the little baby mammoth. And this artist actually is a paleo artist. They specialize in recreating scenes from the past. And so all of this vegetation and other animals in the picture, we believe would have lived in this area of California during the time of Hayden's existence. And then the artist did a really cool thing. He actually overlaid the scene at La Brea and Wilshire, action that Hayden was found below. He overlaid that in the sky to show that we found Hayden right below that intersection and that is what it looked like at the time. Uh, this artist did an amazing job and we were all really pleased with his work. Uh, my company, Cogstone, actually used his work as our Christmas card one year. Now, of course, we've talked a lot about the poster child for the purple line. It was the first fossil we found. It made it all over the news, both locally and nationwide, uh, and a really huge deal. But I also want to point out some of the other really cool fossils we've found. This here, you can see it is quite long. Uh, the, the increments on the, the measuring tape are in centimeters. So we're looking at over a meter in length, so just over three feet. This is actually a humerus, or the upper arm bone, from another mammoth, found in a completely different area of the station. So we do not believe it was associated with the other elephant material we found. So we are finding both mammoths and mastodons, which has been really exciting because they were some of the dominant animals from the time. But we're also finding things that are very unique. This is an ulna, or the forearm bone, from a camelops. Yes, camels were native to Southern California. Wow. Camelops is an ancient ancestor to modern camels, was probably a single humped dromedary, and camels did not do well in North America. They went extinct in North America and thrived in places further south. But you know, it's when you hear Ice Age, you think of mammoths and saber tooth cats and giant ground slots, and we have found all of those things, but nobody ever thinks of camels being native to LA. Then this specimen is humongous. The scale bar down in the center is showing 10 centimeters, which is um, about the width of all of your fingers. A typical finger is about a let me rephrase that. A typical female finger is about a centimeter wide. So 10 centimeters is if you put all four of your fingers together and then add two more. So that's the scale here. This is a pelvis or the hip bone from a giant ground sloth. And because it is in such good shape and we can see the distinct curvature of the birth canal, we know that this animal was a female. And so it's named Shakira because her hips don't lie. Now, I'm sure you are all a little puzzled. I said giant ground sloth. Um, when you hear sloth, you think slow, cute, leaf-eating creature. Well, when I say giant ground sloth, I'm still talking about a slow, cute, leaf-eating creature, but it's the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. These animals were enormous, and they actually had really huge claws, which seems like a weird thing for a plant eater to have, but it's really not for defense. It's to make eating a little bit easier. Because when you're the size of a Volkswagen, you need to eat a lot. And so they use their big claws to grab branches and literally just strip the leaves off of them and then shove all of those leaves right into their mouth. Now, if you have one of those herb um, shredders where you can put a, like a sprig of thyme or rosemary through a little hole and it strips off all of the herbs for you to use in cooking, that's basically what the giant ground sloth used its claws for to get leaves off of trees. Was it just as slow, Dr. Ledger? Um, we're actually not sure. We assume they are very slow because their bone structure indicates that, okay, so if, you've, if you're sitting at your chair and you've got your feet flat on the floor, roll your feet so that you're standing on the outside edges of your feet, kind of bows your knees out to the sides. They actually walked on the outside edges of their feet. They 
not walk on the flats of their feet. And if you're feeling so inclined, feel free to try to walk around just yeah, for a little yeah. bit on the edge of your feet. <laughs> Would you go back two slides so I can see the picture? The yes. Yard? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. You can kind of see there, it's not real clear from the image, but you can tell on its right foot that it's rolled out onto its edge and they walk on the edges of their feet. So I cannot imagine they moved very quickly, but they are so large and they do have those big claws that it was probably unlikely that many things tried to eat them. Now, of course, there are some very big scary predators during the Pleistocene, like the saber-toothed cat and the dire wolf. And we have found remains of both of those along the purple line as well. So we get a pretty good idea that this guy would have had to keep his eyes open while he was eating. It doesn't look as cute though. Yeah, they're not quite as cute as the little tiny sloths we think of today, but you know, for a big gentle giant, I still think they're pretty cool. And sloths are actually one of the more abundant animals we're finding. We have found eight individual ground sloths, which may not sound like a lot, but for paleontology, it is, an it is a massive amount to find of a single species. Um, if you watch the video, you probably heard me say that less than 1% of life on Earth actually fossilizes. So for every animal we find, you have to imagine that about 100 lived in the area. So the fact that we have found eight giant ground sloths means there were at least 800 of them living in the Los Angeles area. And that's pretty hard to fathom. Now the two most abundant animals we're finding are horses and bison. This is one of the bison skulls we have found. And if you're familiar with the North American bison from you know, Yellowstone or the Badlands in that area in South Dakota, these animals looked very similar from the Pleistocene. They were just a bit larger. And we have actually found several different bison skulls. We actually have found three. This one is the one in the best condition and has its full dental battery. It has all of its teeth. And so it is a really beautiful specimen. So we have found three bison skulls, but then we have found a fourth partial skull. This is what's called a bison horn core. So I'm gonna flip back real quick and go to this picture of this bison. So you see its horns there, but know that that horn you're looking at is a keratin sheath. It's similar to what's made out of hair and fingernails, but woven very tightly together for its strength. But there is a bone cone on the inside of that, so that when these animals fight with each other, their horns don't just snap off. You, I, you can imagine if you had a horn made of basically compacted fingernails and you were fighting with another individual, those would just snap away but by having the bone beneath it, it allows those horns to be more rigid and protected. So what we're finding is we only find the bone core. We don't actually find the sheath that has disintegrated over the last 20 to 60,000 years. But this horn core, and from a specimen named Andy, is almost three feet long. Now, when this image was taken, we were missing that middle section, but that section was what was hit by the bulldozer. We have all of those pieces and this, this horn core is almost completely reconstructed. And so we have been able to fill in that gap. But if you can imagine, if the horn core is three feet long, the horn itself that would be visible would be even longer than that. And so from tip of one horn to the other horn of this individual, we're talking about nine feet. Now I'm gonna say that again because that's a lot to take in from the tip of one horn to the tip of the other horn would be about nine feet in length. These animals were humongous. Now this is a very grainy image, but I found this one because it was the best I could see that kind of shows the scale. Now it is showing bison latifrons, the long horned bison form. They're close to a six foot adult man and next to the smaller North American bison. So this gives you an idea of just how big this bison was. And so we were so thrilled to have found uh, Andy's horn core. Now here's the fun part. Just like some of us on the call are really tall or some of us are really short and some have red hair or brown hair or blonde hair or gray hair. That is a genetic factor, but we all have those same features. We all have a height and we all pretty much have hair at least somewhere on our bodies. And so, it's just a, gen it's a genetic difference. We might have different colored hair. 
well, bison lanifrons may have had curved or straight horns. The bison horn core we found from Andy is the straight horned form. This individual shown in the picture is the curved horn form. Sorry, that's really hard to say. Andy is actually the only known straight horned bison latifrons from the state of California. So we are very proud of some of the specimens we're finding. And then we are finding a multitude of other things. Pretty much anything you can think of from the Ice Age. Rabbits, gophers, horses, llamas, deer, pronghorn antelope. And now, if everyone is confused at how a whale fits in with this collection of animals, it's because we found whale fossils also. Now, of course, not in the same layers as we're finding the mammoths and the bison and the horses, but about 60 feet exactly to where we found Hayden, we found a broken whale skull. And so that is showing us the history of Los Angeles. Tens of thousands of years ago, this area was crawling with those Pleistocene mammals. But hundreds of thousands of years ago, Los Angeles was at the bottom of the ocean and there were fish and whales and sharks swimming in the area. So looking through the fossils and digging a hole as big as we're digging for the purple line really tells us a very unique story about what was happening in Los Angeles through time. And one of the best parts of everything we're doing is the education aspect. Um, any chance we are given, we will take actual fossils. These on the table are all fossils found from the purple line. They are all the original fossils. None of them are casts so that people can come and talk to us and actually get to touch a real fossil. Because it's interesting, when you go to a museum, you always get to look but not touch. And there is just a different connection when you can actually feel that bone in your fingers. And so we have done lots of the Metro events. This was Metro's sustainability event. And we have done the Halfway to La Cienega event. And pretty much any event that Metro wants us to be there with a table of fossils, we'll do it. Um, I know Glysa was on the call and I know Glysa has brought her kids several times to come and see these fossils because there is just something magical about telling your children, look, these fossils were found at an area where I can show you and you can touch them. So we're really proud of everything we're finding, everything we're doing, and we hope to continue to find more fossils. I am going to bring my, I'm going to bring my video back. I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can see your lovely faces. Thank you all so much for your attention. And now is when I turn it to you and say, what questions do you have for me? Because I would love to answer them. There's some questions in the chat box. Oh, um, let me pull that up. Susan wants to know, how did you get this assignment? Luck, pure <laughs> luck. So when any construction project is happening where there's going to be known fossil discoveries, uh, companies like mine apply to be one of the contractors. So we were actually teamed with Skanska Trailer Shea uh, they had contacted us and said, hey, we're going to put together this big proposal, but we're going to need a paleontologist. Would you like to work with us? And we said, absolutely. And they ended up being awarded the contract. So we were brought on too. Now that's section one of the purple line. But for example, section two, Tudor Perini uh, and Associates is the company that won the project. They won the contract and we were teamed with them as well. And so we are working on sections one and two of the purple line so far. And it is the greatest opportunity because, I mean, every paleontologist in the world would love to dig a pit as big as we're digging this close to the La Brea tar pits. And so we're incredibly lucky. And for me, even more so. Um, in 2016, I actually got a call from the owner of Cogstone at the time. Sherry Gust called me. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away about a year ago. But she called me and said, hey, do you have your PhD yet? And I met Sherry years before at a La Brea Tar Pits Christmas party. I was actually in town doing research the same day as their Christmas party and they said, hey, you're here, you're a visiting scientist, you might as well come to our party tonight. And so I said, okay. And at the party I met Sherry who drilled me about my research. She wanted to know every little bit of detail I was doing for my dissertation. And when I finished she said, okay, good. I needed to make sure you actually knew your stuff because I uh, own the company Cogstone and we have two mammoth skulls in a warehouse that no one knows about. 
Wow. <laughs> I got to measure I got to measure two mammoth skulls that were not documented at the time and they actually are included in my research. And because of my research, they were accessioned into museums because as a scientist, you cannot publish on a specimen that cannot be studied by other scientists. And the two skulls that Cogstone had found long before I ever joined the company were so beautiful, they're now in museums. And wow. uh, Sherry called me and said, do you have your PhD yet? And I said, no, but I graduate in about three weeks. What's up? She says, excellent. I have a job in LA for you. I know you specialize in Pleistocene megafauna and there's a subway that's going right past the La Brea Tar Pits and we need someone to head that project who has experience working on Pleistocene fossils. And so I graduated uh, mid-May of 2016 and a week later I lived in LA and I worked for Cogstone. <laughs> Preparation <laughs> and, and luck. <laughs> yes, and it's been the greatest opportunity I could imagine. Um, we have had so much fun and found so many fossils, and I love working for Cogstone and all the outreach we do. It's been a dream come true, and then I get to work with wonderful people like you. You can tell that you're you're passionate about your work, and it, it makes your sharing so much more um, entertaining and engaging, so we, we appreciate you. We have a, a few more questions here. Uh, Fran wants to know, where is your lab located? Oh, Fran, good question. Our, our lab is actually in Orange County. We have a lab in Orange and we have a lab in Riverside. Riverside is where most of the preparation on our fossils is being done. So occasionally we just, you know, if we have a bunch of fossils that are sitting in my office, we get in the car and we drive them to the lab. Other times, like when we find Hayden, he doesn't fit in anyone's car. So we rented a U-Haul and then drove him to Riverside and dropped him off there. Uh, that's an excellent question. So most of the work is done in Riverside and Cogstone will maintain possession of all of the fossils until each section of the project is done. Because all of our fossils are going to the Natural History Museum, they do not want a slow trickle of fossils. They want them all at once. They'd rather have a semi full of bones so that they can accession them in order. And we're hoping everyone keep their fingers crossed that they'll put some of our specimens on display because as you saw, some of the bison skulls and the sloth pelvis and the mammoth skull are so beautiful. We hope that the citizens of LA will get to see those on a regular basis. Manuela wants to know how old can mammoths live? Excellent question, Manuela. A mammoth, if it didn't uh, die from being hunted or getting sick, would typically live to about 70 years old. We know that by their teeth. Once they get up into those really older years, they actually grind flat the last surface of their teeth and they're not able to chew enough vegetation to support them. So they actually starve to death if they get that old. Now we're not sure what happened to Hayden, what caused him to die so young. Well, him or her, I mentioned we don't know what sex the animal is. It could have been disease, it could have, uh, it could have maybe drowned in a watering area, but we did not notice any bite marks on the skull, so it's very unlikely that he was hunted by other animals. Dr. Ledger, you mentioned that um, there are um, things that don't fossilize. Why, why does something fossilize and not fossilize? Is it just where it dies in the elements or? That is an excellent question and an excellent observation. Yes, it is very dependent on where it dies. Uh, it is very difficult to turn bone into a fossil because it has to be a very specific set of conditions that are met. So usually it needs to be buried very, very quickly and exposed to that low oxygen condition so that it does have time and not predated on. As you can imagine, animals of this time, if they find a carcass, they want to eat it. And so you need that rapid burial, that low oxygenation, and that's how fossils happen. Now we were lucky. Uh, the sediment we found Hayden in was indicative of water. So we think it was in a river or a stream in the area at the time. And so that probably helped to bury his very large body in mud quite quickly. It sunk beneath the water and then was able to be buried so that it did preserve as beautifully as it is. Fran wants to know, how did these animals get here? Migration. <laughs> That's an excellent question. Fran, you've got some wonderful questions for me. <laughs> so typically animals migrate into areas. So we know from, I'm going to use mammoths as an example, possibly because they're my favorite animal. Um, mammoths originated in Europe and Asia, and that, that was Mammuthus meridionalis. And Mammuthus meridionalis crossed land strait and ended up on the North American continent where it evolved into several other species. It evolved into the woolly mammoth up north and the Colombian mammoth farther south. 
and so these animals migrate. Uh, similar, similar situation for the camels. They migrated into North America. They continued south into South America, and as the climate changed, North America was no longer well suited for camels, and so they ended up in South America. Great any, questions. I know, right? Does anyone have any questions that they want to sh ask? Thank you. I want to ask something about um, in that area. There, uh, there was some oil they 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 found, and the these um, specimens, these fossils you found, were they also in oil pits or? Um, just plain dirt? Ursula, excellent question. Um, a little bit of both. So the oil you're referring to are the tar pits. That is That asphaltic material is oil-based. And so we do find fossils in the asphalt, as noted by the La Brea tar pits. I hope everybody has been there at some point. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. But we did find a handful of fossils in the asphalt. Now, when Cogstone was awarded this project, we assumed we would find La Brea tar pits type deposits and find thousands of fossils contained within the asphalt. And we found five. Oh. Wow. Mother Nature played a cruel joke on us. Actually, most of our fossils, the other 2,000 plus, came from the La Cienega station in Beverly Hills. Oh. Um, there, there were a few fossils from the La Brea station, like Hayden and the whale skull. Fairfax had a handful of bones, and then La Cienega is the treasure trove. And so we, we have been working with both asphaltic and non-asphaltic fossils. I can tell you from experience, fossils not found in asphalt are much easier to work with than the ones found in asphalt. They're clean, they're dry. Once you're done cleaning them, you're done cleaning them. They don't continue to ooze asphalt, but we have found both. Oh, I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your great question. Uh, I saw another question in the chat about will the art of the stations showcase these findings? That's a good question. Um, that is an excellent question and yes, we have been contacted at Cogstone by many of the artists selected by Metro and they would like to incorporate the fossils in various ways. I, uh, I don't think I'm allowed to disclose to you how they want to showcase them, but the fossils will be a prominent piece of the art fixtures. Good. Did people live alongside these animals? Irene great, asks. great question. Yes no. and no. It depends on if you're talking about our fossils specifically or Pleistocene animals in general. Humans were not evident in this area of California during the age of fossils we're finding. So during this part of the Pleistocene where we're 20 to 60,000 years old, there were not humans in this part of LA. So our fossils from the Purple Line never encountered humans. But through time, closer to the end of the Pleistocene, humans and these animals did interact. Uh, in fact, they were hunted. Humans love to eat things that they can catch, and a mammoth would provide a lot of food for a very long time. And so these animals were hunted by humans uh, globally near the end of the Pleistocene. But our fossils in particular never encountered humans until we found them. <laughs> is, is there anything that you are like the mother load of fossils like people say there is something out there and you're hoping that you guys encounter it along the way well when we started the project we had a wish list as yes. funny as that sounds so of course you always want to find a skull because skulls are the most easy to recognize and people get the most excited about them and so we were hoping for one <coughs> excuse me we have found four bison skulls, one giant ground sloth skull, and uh, so we're doing great. So because everybody's main wish was, I hope we find a skull that we can showcase and get the, the citizens excited about. Well, that was the very first fossil we found. So we had to amend our wish list. And so our wish list included things like saber tooth cats and dire wolves. Well, we've found both of those too. Then we thought, okay, it'd be really cool to find a giant ground sloth. Well, we found those too. So right now, our wish list basically is very vague. We just want to find more. Oh, yeah. Because every single thing we have found has been so exciting and so beautifully preserved that we're actually excited about every single bone 
Now for me personally, uh, when I lived in South Dakota for graduate school, I worked at a place called the Mammoth Site. Uh, if you're so interested and you ever visit the Black Hills of South Dakota, I would highly recommend also going to the Mammoth Site of Hot Springs, South Dakota. It's a sinkhole and they have found the remains of over 60 mammoths within that hole. And so I had spent my entire career studying mammoths. I'd worked at the mammoth site for 10 years. My entire dissertation was on Colombian and pygmy mammoths. And so it was a bit scary for me to leave my mammoth comfort zone and go work in somewhere where it was everything Pleistocene. So for the first fossil for me to be a mammoth skull, absolute dream come true. It doesn't matter to me what they find next. I love it all. <laughs> That's neat. Any other questions, guys? Um, I see a question in the chat about finding human fossils. No, we have not found any human fossils from the purple line. Cogstone as a company has found human remains. We do paleontological, which is animal remains, and archaeological excavations, which is human association. So that includes human remains or human associated things like coins or pottery, things along those lines. And my company does both of those things. But I am strictly a paleontologist, so I actually don't do any sort of human work. Mm. So Paul, which you one? have a question. Yes, I do. Uh, which one is your favorite uh, fossil find? I can't pick just one. I have two. Um, <laughs> okay. So Hayden. They're like children, I'm sure. <laughs> they are. They're like my babies. So Hayden is very special to me because I do love mammoths. And so Hayden was my first favorite, but it was also our first find. Um, but in May of 2019 is when we found Andy, the bison horn core. And that specimen is my other favorite one because it's so unique to California. Uh, it's so impressive and especially getting to compare it to from one bison to another, we can show the difference in those horn core sizes. It's just so unique paleontologically. And then it's special to me personally. Uh, I actually lost a very close friend in April of that year uh, to a tragic accident. She was actually on a school field trip with her university and fell off a cliff. Oh, um, and my friend Andrea was very involved and she read every single news article that ever came out about the Purple Line. She had worked with me at the Mammoth site and loved fossils. And Andrea always wanted to know right away. She'd always be like, okay, tell me as soon as you find fossils. And I'd always say, sweetie, I can't. I can't tell mm -hmm. you until there's a press release, but you bet I'll be the, I'll send you the article first. Mm -hmm. And so she was the biggest fan of the Metro Purple Line paleontology living in Iowa at the time. Wow. And wow. Uh, she, mm -hmm. she passed away in April. And then the next fossil we found was actually the horn core of Andy. And they let me name it because uh, I was having such a hard time. They were like, Ashley, you name this one. Nice. So I named it Andy after her. And ironically, she, her high school mascot was the bison. So the fact oh, that the first fossil uh, we found that's after cool. I lost a friend of mine, it was really special to me personally. It was and meant to be. Yes, and it's just so unique paleontologically. The fact that we found mm -hmm. the only straight horned latifrons in all of California, good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> There's I a question. A question in the chat box from May Sue. How many kinds of animal fossils have been found? I have lost count <laughs> how many kinds of animal fossils have been found. We, so we have every animal you can think of from the Ice Age, but then a bunch of those you don't think of, like the gophers and snails, um, rabbits, turtles, uh, things like that. Now those little tiny fossils, we don't necessarily find while we're excavating. They're, they're much too small to see. But every time we find a fossil, we also just dig up a bucket of sediment, a five gallon bucket of just dirt. And then we wash all of that and pick through it by hand under a microscope back in our lab and look for what we call microfossils. And that tells us about the small animals that were living in this time that we can't actually just visually see while we're underground. And so we have tons of species because we're finding so many microfossils as well. Wow. Anyone else? Any questions? How often do you take the bucket of, of sediment or the bucket of dirt to, to look for the smaller micro um, stuff? The micro stuff. <laughs> I, I missed the first part of the question. What was that? How often do you take a bucket of dirt to find the micro fossils? We take a bucket of dirt every single time we find a fossil because when we find a fossil, we know that the conditions are right for fossil preservation. So we know that's our most likely to find fossils. But if we're in a dry spell where we're not finding fossils for several months, 
we take a bucket every time the geologic layers change. If our monitor is underground and notice that we've gone from a sandy layer to a very clay rich layer, we know something environmentally changed. And so we take a new bucket of sediment so we can look through that. So my lab staff has been very busy cleaning and washing and picking through dirt. And there's big patience. That really yes. takes a lot of patience. I know that I could do that. We're all very patient and it is just, it's one of the traits that comes with being a paleontologist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyone else with question? There's I a question, one. question oh, in yeah. the chat. Oh, I'm gonna, question in the chat. I'm gonna find this photo so I can answer the question. I've been asked what's the okay. white thing in the picture with the bison. So I'm going to steal the screen again here just as soon as I get to the bison photos. Um, let's see. Open I see Zoom your question. I see your question, Marilyn. What got you interested in this field to begin your studies? Oh, for me, I was seven years old on a family vacation to the Black Hills of South Dakota, and my family took me to the mammoth site, actually. And I left that day, and I told my mom, that's what I want to do when I grow up. And she smiled and patted me on the head and said, mm-hmm, I'm sure. Yeah. And <laughs> she had no idea that that's what I would really pursue. <laughs> Oh, no, fairness, cool. I, I don't blame my mother because at the same time, my career goals were to either be a paleontologist, a veterinarian, or the red power ranger. <laughs> but only the red one. I only wanted to be the red one. Okay, so I'm going to steal your screen here again. Okay. And we're going to go back and look at bison. Let's make these pictures bigger. If my computer will work with me. Nope, guess we don't get to make them bigger. Okay, well, we'll look at them this size. <laughs> Can you all see them? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was asked about the white thing. Were we referring to this image? Yes, that's what I wanted to know about. The, this thing in the middle of its nose? Yes. yes. That is actually a sandbag. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> so we use various sizes of sandbags because if you... Can you see my cursor? When I move my cursor, can you all see yes. that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So if you look back here in this big bucket of sand, this bucket is where we are reassembling the broken piece of its face. This is over here sitting in the sand so that the glue can dry. And this piece will be flipped up and it fits right here above that uh -huh. sandbag. Okay. So they leave, they have the sandbag there so that they can set that piece back in place and take a look at it and try to fit the edges because then here's another sneak peek. This box is actually full of bone fragments. That's where the broken pieces are coming from that they're using to put those back together. And then specifically this big piece right here, this is actually the other horn. We have the horn that sits on this side of its skull. We just haven't reassembled enough of the pieces to attach it yet. So this is the slow, tedious part of fossil finds, but it is why we take so much care in the field to make sure we get as much of the specimen as we can, because we know that people are really good at putting those back together. Wow, that's very impressive. Thank you. Excellent question. Um, Ashley, are, are, is, there, is there any dig activity continuing or are you done with that? No, they are still digging actually at La Brea, La Cienega, and Fairfax Station. They're still working at all three on what's known as the appendages. Mm -hmm. So they're back closer to the surface. And so it's like starting over again. We're back in those early layers of the Pleistocene. So we're expecting to find fossils all over again at all three fossils. It's a, it's a non-ending, it seems, at this point, And we're glad. The more they want to dig, the more we will be in support of that because it's You're like incredible. subway to the sea, let's do it. <laughs> yes, please, please keep finding more, please keep finding more fossils for us. We would love to, to continue digging as long as you'll have us. What type of glue or cements are used to put these together? That's Fran. <laughs> <laughs> Fran, you have wonderful questions. Fran, you need to come visit us in the lab. We have a <laughs> little field trip someday, let's make it happen. Let's, let's make a field trip happen. Um, we actually use, there's a, there are some paleontological glues that are commonly used for fossils. And they are butvar based, which okay. butvar is a, is a crystalline substance that can be dissolved in acetone. Mm -hmm. And you can right. make that glue as thin or as thick as you'd like. So we make really thin glue that we call consolidant. And we put that basically over everything because it soaks into the bone and hardens it, making it 
more durable and longer to last long term. Because remember, these specimens had never been exposed to the light of day. And so we have changed their environmental pressure. They were used to the weight of all of the sediment. And so they would break down over time just by being exposed to different atmospheric pressures. So we consolidate them to keep them firm and solid. But then when we have broken pieces, we use a thick version of the glue that is just mixed with less acetone. But this glue is handy because it means that if we ever wanted to take these pieces back apart, we can. They would, just, they would just need more acetone and then acetone. we could undo all of the work we had done. Right, yeah, okay. Very right. interesting. I yeah, think that are, we would all are. love to go on a field trip, so yes. that's yes. even possible. Yes. Oh my yes. God, I have yes. possible. <laughs> I would, I would love to get to do that with you all at some point. Mike, you had a question? Could, um, I am a chemist. Could you tell me more about this butavar adhesive? It's a... No. <laughs> <laughs> what is butavar? Is yes. that a trade, a trade name or, a, 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 or what it's made out of? I think it's what it's made out of because it's <laughs> because the brand name is actually called Paleo Bond. Paleo Bond. <laughs> so I'll, I'll so I believe up. I believe Butvar is the actual crystal. I think it's spelled uh -huh. B U T V A R. But no, I don't know much about the chemistry <laughs> behind it, but I know really well how to use it. <laughs> You're <Thank> honest. You. <laughs> I, I am honest to a fault. I'm going to have a little bit of fun here, guys. I'm going to steal your screen <laughs> one more time. After I got into paleontology, my mom sent me some blast from the pasts. Can you see this picture? Yes. yes. Here's, me, uh, here's uh. me and my dad when I was seven years old at the mammoth site. The best part of this is, remember, at the time I wanted to be a Power Ranger. I am wearing a Power Ranger t-shirt and Power Ranger shorts, and my Power Ranger shorts are covered with um, mastodons. Uh. The black Power Ranger, he wore a black jumpsuit, and his, his special animal was the mastodon. So I was destined to study Holy ancient elephants. Holy smokes! It was just <laughs> guiding you to your destiny. Absolutely. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was meant to be. That's but funny. no, I, uh, I got to visit wow. the site when I was just a wee little thing and had a great trip. Of course, my mom's not in the picture because she's always taking pictures. Of and course. she, at the time, did not realize that I would care more about the mammoth skull that she cut off its tusks in this photo <laughs> in the background. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, mom, you've got to include the rest of the specimens. You can't just focus on me and dad. You've got to get the big picture. Oh, but gosh. This, was, this was also at the mammoth site. And this is a scale representation of how big these animals would be with skin and muscle on them. And you can see that as a seven-year-old, I barely came up to its armpit. Yeah, that's insane. So we're getting lots of thanks for a great presentation. Yes. Vanessa, oh. Tim, and Irene, um, Dr. Ledger, this was really um, eye-opening and fun and engaging. So oh, thank I'm you so, so much. I'm glad. And, and thank you for having me because this has been great. I have loved hearing all of your questions. That is always the best part for me is getting to hear what everybody else is excited about. And so the fact that you all have such wonderful questions means the absolute world to me. Thank you for coming. And truly, your group is wonderful. I would love to get to meet you all in person someday. And when this pandemic ends, Lily, let's plan a field trip to the tar yeah, pits or maybe absolutely. even down to the lab. Yes, the lab. we would love that. Oh, yeah. We would love that. Um, Glysa, thank you so much for connecting us to Dr. Ledger and uh, bringing us this uh, very fun presentation. So everyone, My pleasure. Thank, thank you for coming uh, today, guys, and sticking around. This is longer than we usually stick around, but you really captured I'm so everybody's sorry. attention. They really uh, enjoyed it, I think. Um, well, I'm glad. Guys. I hope you can sh share... I hope you can share information about the fossils with your communities. And Lily, feel free to, you know, send an email with my email address in it so that if they have more questions, you can contact me. You can tell I really enjoy talking about fossils. <laughs> Thank you for the wonderful comments. But if, if your brains are spinning today and you have more questions and you're just dying to know, please shoot, e you know, shoot an email to Lily or Glysa if you know her. They'll get them to me and I'd be happy to answer it. One more comment in the chat. Oh, one more. Oh, you guys are so wonderful. Thank you so much. Was there a yes. question? 
I see lots it of It wasn't comments. a question. Comment. I see lots yeah. of thank you. Thank I have you, Ashley. I will definitely read through all of these just, again. And, you know, maybe we'll find a whole bunch more fossils coming up soon. And we can do this again. And I'll tell you about our new finds. Please. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. We really yeah. enjoyed it. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you for joining us today. Take care, everyone. We'll see you on the 16th. Wear your costumes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Might as well. Sounds like fun to me. Bye, everyone. So good to see you. Bye, Mike. Bye, Marcy. Bye, Irene. Bye, Manuela. Bye, June. Richardson, Paul, and Paul. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Be safe. Bye.